Good evening, everyone. This is Dr. Bill with World Bible School, and welcome to Kingdom Dynamics. Uh, good to see Dr. K. Fairchild joining, and I see others are already uh, hopping in here and watching tonight. So, praise the Lord. It has been a busy week. Tomorrow is Friday, and that doesn't mean it's going to be any less busy. So, <laughs> uh, it'll be a busy weekend, but uh, we have about 210 students graduating in May. So it takes a lot to get all of that ready, and uh, all of us in the offices are working very hard to get that done. Good to see Tarzi Martin joining us tonight from uh, the Borneo Islands and uh, the Malaysia area, pastor of two uh, groups there. Uh, he is a, a great young man. Uh, Joseph Waller is joining us tonight. He's going to be on a series with me on Fridays uh, soon. I don't know how soon, but we're working on that. Uh, got him scheduled. So anyway, uh, good to see everybody and everybody that will be joining. Those that will be watching this video after it's on YouTube, many of you do that. And also those that may see this a month or even a year down the road, we just bless you and thank you for watching. So tonight back with me um, is Dr. Cindy Coates. Uh, I think it was about I'm just guessing it was about January 17th that we did uh, a live together and we talked about present truth and what didn't really have any clue that it was going to turn into two sessions. But uh, here we are back again uh, for part two. And uh, so, Dr. Cindy, welcome back to Kingdom Dynamics. Thank you. I'm so excited about being back tonight. I just thank God for the overflow and the continuation of what he started in the last time we were together. That's awesome. And I'm so appreciative to be here and to see everybody here uh, tonight that's tuning in. Yes. Amen. And uh, so uh, as we get into this, I know we're going to uh, tap into some stuff that will be a blessing to you. Uh, good to see Apostle Daniel Williams joining us tonight uh, and everybody else out there that's coming. So, um, uh, I want to say that, first of all, there will be no show tomorrow. Um, I have a, a an apostle a cons a cons a consecration tomorrow uh, to do, but uh, other than that, it's just been a real busy time. I'm still going to be working after the show tonight to get one of my lessons finished up and posted and uh, uh, helping Dr. Faye with one. So it's uh, it's a busy time. We, we just love all of you. and We love what we're doing. We're so grateful for World Bible School University. Uh, we had no clue, Dr. Cindy. I mean, I was doing World Bible School media broadcasts for quite a while, uh, and uh, all of a sudden we come up with uh, World Bible School University, and the first word out of the the, the shoot, so to speak, someone said, well, that's kind of redundant, saying new school and university. So, well, you know what? That's okay. We like it. And uh, so uh, good to see Dr. Fay joining us from the next office tonight. Uh, busy, busy, busy over there. So we uh, have been talking about and discussing what, uh, and we're going to be talking about tonight, what Jesus said about the last days. And of course, our version of the last days will probably be different than what some people think about the last days, uh, but um, uh, that's okay. Uh, and uh, something, and I love this statement, and something every prophet should know. Now, I would just jump right into Matthew 25, but here's what I want to do. We were talking about Matthew 20, uh, 24 uh, and um, uh, last time, uh, but uh, we didn't have a lot of time to get together this week. Dr. Cindy's been extremely busy. We've been extremely busy. And so I'm going to let you introduce tonight and just tell us where we're going to go, how this is going to work, and we'll just take it from there. Okay, so if I recall the last time we were together, we were talking about the reasons why we need to get 
our eschatology correct. Mm -hmm. It's super important. We were talking about some of the things that occurred in my life as a child and even as a teenager. Real quick uh, recap. When I was a child, I was um, told at the age of five years old that the moon was going to turn a bloody red and that the devil was going to take over the world and that the Antichrist was going to come and behead everybody who didn't get raptured. I, I was told that at the age of five. Wow. Um, um, then uh, at the age of 16, 15, 16, I'm in youth choir and we're singing the old Larry Norman song. Life was filled with guns and wars and everyone got trampled on the floor. I wish we'd all been ready. Um, and so that's not a very uh, edifying song, hello. And um, that caused a tremendous amount of fear uh, that was um, added to the fear of being a child and hearing about all this. And so, you know, growing up in the Baptist church, I loved the Baptist. God bless the Baptist. Um, if it wasn't for the Baptists, I wouldn't know a whole lot that I do know. And I'm thankful to all my yes. beautiful Baptist friends. I'm not mad at you. No. But I will say that due to the teaching, not only with the Baptists, but most evangelicals who um, bought the Hal Lindsey books and um, 88 Reasons Why Jesus is Coming Back in 1988. <laughs> and then there was another one the next year about uh, 89 reasons why Jesus is coming back in 1989, you know, so anything to sell a book, it seemed like, and uh, most people were too busy to sit down and study their Bibles, and so they would depend on these um, uh, dystopian fiction um, books, that like, uh, like Great Planet Earth, and things like that, and then later on, Left Behind, um, to, uh, to, to, to get their um, truth from to get their uh, Bible study from these fiction books and mm -hmm. anyway um, because of that as a, as a teenager I was an alcoholic I became an alcoholic in in 10th oh. grade um, I was so scared and so um, I needed to be numbed out like every day because this whole I was obsessed with the idea of being left behind and beheaded I mean it was like a real phobia I had a phobia and I had separation anxiety. I thought Jesus was gone. I thought he wasn't back. And I had to keep looking up in the sky, waiting for Jesus to come back because he's not here, you know? And it's like, all this stuff is funny now. It's funny now, thank God we can sure. laugh about it. That's but true. you know, back then, um, when you're a young teenager and then you're trying to put together all the puzzle pieces, you know, in your worldview and, um, yeah, so I got really scared, and I thank God for the Holy Spirit. Got baptized in the Holy Spirit in the eleventh grade, and the uh, um, alcohol left me. Praise God! I was delivered instantly of alcohol, which that doesn't happen, you know, a whole lot. And, and I'm very thankful for that testimony. Then, when fast forward, when I got married, my husband and I were planning churches, and and we were establishing ministries and helping other people with their ministries too. Um, we needed something to supplement our, our income uh, because it was a startup churches and things. And so we started selling life insurance to Christians that were believing to get raptured. Now that's a feat right there. That is a, you know, anybody that can sell a life insurance policy to a Christian looking for the big escape day it's a it's a miracle we couldn't sell life insurance to our warm market they call it warm market because they weren't interested in and in sticking around here you know and then um when i started being a speaker in the fellowship of christian athletes um i uh was um approached by a young cheerleader in high school who discovered she was pregnant and she wanted to get an abortion. And she's a Christian too, by the way. A Christian raised in the church wanted to get an abortion because she said 
Jesus said in the last days, woe to those who are pregnant and nursing. She thought Jesus was uh, condoning abortion. And how many young girls in the church throughout the past several decades have probably looked at those verses, Matthew 24, 19, and thought that Jesus was talking about don't be pregnant because we're in the last days. It's ridiculous. Yes. So these things I, I just touched on with separation anxiety, alcoholism and addiction and abortion. These things are very serious uh, repercussions of having a very flawed, erroneous worldview. And so um, I promised everybody I would never, ever, ever teach my kids in times because nobody could agree on it and nobody knew what they were talking about. They would, they were these different groups that were fussing and fighting about it. All I wanted my kids to know uh, is that Jesus was wonderful and loved them and he had a great plan for their life and he was a healer and a comforter and uh, he was fun. Yeah. I let them know that Jesus was hilarious and had a great sense of humor. They know that side of Jesus. A lot of Christians don't know that side of Jesus, by the way, but they have a great sense of humor. They got that from Jesus directly. And um, yeah, so uh, thank God that um, when my oldest son who had Asperger's um, was curious about some things some kids were saying at a lunch uh, one day uh, about what does this all mean? We went and sat on the couch at the house and open up Revelation, the book of Revelation right here. And um, it says, I'll just read the verse three verses in, in chapter one. It says, it's the revelation of Jesus Christ, not the Antichrist, as so many teach, uh, which God gave him to show his servants things which must shortly take place, shortly take place. That's an interesting phrase. Yep. And he sent and signified it by his angel to his servant, John, who bore witness uh, to the word of God and to the testimony of Jesus Christ to all things that he saw. Blessed is he who reads and those who hear the words of this prophecy and keep those things which are written in it for the time is near. And verse four says, and John uh, to the seven churches, which are in Asia says, grace and peace be unto you and et cetera. So the book of Revelation was never a book originally. It was a letter written to seven churches, the seven literal churches the Apostle Paul had planted. The Apostle Paul at the time of this writing had been beheaded. Um, the Apostle uh, Andrew had already been crucified on a what we call St. Andrew's cross. It's shaped like an X. And then um, Peter had already been uh, crucified upside down. So the only one left from the Mount of Olives, if you recall, who was at the Mount of Olives with Jesus? Peter, James, John, and Andrew. And they were all gone except for John. Okay. Now, James is debatable. He could have still been alive. He planted some churches in India uh, and Thomas. But, um, and he was also the Bishop of Jerusalem. But anyway, the thing is, is that uh, who was still around? John. So John's writing this letter. So my son with Asperger says, so when, who, who is John, mom? And I said, you know, John, he's the beloved, you know, the one who called himself the beloved of the Lord, you know, because he had a real good self-esteem. You know, he thought very well of himself. I think we should all call ourselves the beloved. But John had the revelation, good for him. And he wrote uh, John 1, 2, and 3, and then what we call the book of Revelation. And so I told uh, Kyle, my oldest son, this, and he says, okay, well, when was this written then, mom? Because I taught my kids to have critical uh, thinking skills and comprehensive reading skills to ask all the W questions. Who's writing? To whom are they writing? When are they yes. writing? Where? What? Why? These things. And so he asked these questions, and but when he got to the point where he asked, so when was this written? Boom. That was the deal breaker for me because I had to do a little research and I discovered that Nero exiled John to the Isle of Patmos. Nero committed suicide in 68, AD 68. 
So it had to be right around that time or a little bit before. It, could, it had to be before AD 70. Uh, it couldn't be after AD 70. So when you look at that, then he says these things are going to happen soon and near. He's pointing to the destruction of Jerusalem in AD 70 when right. Vespasian's, uh, Vespasian, who was emperor at the time, uh, sent his son, Titus, not Titus in the Bible, but a, a, a general in the Roman army. He sent him uh, with all the armies of the earth, which were the Roman army, and all the armies of the earth were, it's a Roman army because Rome ruled the world. And they went in and circled around and, and uh, took the city. It took three and a half years, like the Bible says. Everything took place historically. It's in the past. And what, once we see this, instead of something that's happening now or in the future, we get, it, we get our timeline straightened out. And therefore, we're able to build our life on present truth. And, and it's awesome because we realize Jesus didn't lie when he said in Matthew 24, uh, verse 34, when he said, uh, this generation, the one he was talking to, this generation shall not pass away till all these things be fulfilled. It was the one he was talking to because on the Mount of Olives, he was talking to Peter, James, John, and Andrew. We see that in Mark chapter 13, verse three, they are mentioned as a synoptic you know, Mark, uh, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, synoptic uh, right. stories, narratives, <clears throat> and therefore we know when we connect the dots. So um, that was a loaded answer. I guess you didn't ask, want to know all that information, but anyway. Well, <laughs> well, you know, that's okay. That's okay because you just gave me a lead into uh, the book of Revelation Woo! unveiled volume one, uh, forward by Dr. K. Fairchild. And let me just say that the thing that happened to me was I begin. I mean, I, uh, I, we were walking into the house one day and I crossed over the threshold of the front door and it lighted up. Um, and I thought that meant I was crossing over into something else, but the, the, and it did. But the thing is, is that it was only one way, one direction. There was no other direction. And so I, as, as this happened, I had just started teaching in a home Bible study, the book of Revelation, verse by verse. And it didn't take very long until I became very frustrated uh, because I've got, and I'm just, I'm going to name some names. If you get mad at me tonight, I'm not being critical. Some of you have the same issues. I have, I could name commentaries about uh, uh, timeline charts and how the rapture is going to take place and it's not here yet and all this stuff about the future and well let me not name names okay that that wouldn't be very uh, smart of me but I mean I have I have Bible prophecy Bibles okay by very famous ministers I have all kinds of stuff now in this house since we've lived here four years we moved into a smaller house than we've been used to about 1500 square feet less so a lot of my books are still packed but in the process of being here, I really converted my office into a studio. And so the office part, the office part is kind of like it's around there, but it's not really that big of, uh, of a distraction. And so I'm saying that to say I became very frustrated saying, Lord, these aren't the things I've learned my whole life. Even that my dad, who was a powerful Bible prophecy teacher, had taught me. And you're showing me something different. And I just said, you know what, Lord, I'm not doing this anymore. <laughs> I am not doing this. Well, you know how it is. When you know uh, who you are, it doesn't take very long until you say, you know what, Lord, and this is what I did. I said, Lord, whatever you're doing, that's what I'm doing. And I just was basically saying, Lord, even if I don't understand it, I'm agreeing with you. You know, Dr. Cindy, a portal opened up to me, not, not like I've seen in visions. Okay, I've seen a lot of visions where a portal opened up. This is how I see visions. Portals open up, and I see pictures. But this time, a portal of revelation opened up. And since that time, it has not cut off since. Now, I did the home Bible study. I started teaching it online. We're now teaching all of it in our college. And I'm getting my other three volumes ready to go. So, I mean, this is like a four, thing, four uh, layers for me. And you're right. AD 70. And, and it's like Matthew 24. Jesus is talking about the end being the end of that age when he's going to the cross, not when he's going to come some way far off in the future. Because let's face it, he never left us. Amen. <laughs> Amen. Now that is the truth. That is the truth. He said, 
Lo, I am with you always. I always. Used to, I used to think Lo was my Chinese name. You know? I used to think Lo meant I'm not going to ride in a plane. Because <laughs> he's down here low. <laughs> I just, at least I used to do that. <laughs> oh, my goodness. And then he would say, Oh, ye of little faith. I said, well, maybe my Chinese name is ye too. You know I mean? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> but, but yeah, so God, God revealed these things to us, didn't he, by spirit. I Amen. mean, this, we could not know this unless we were led into this truth because the Holy Spirit leads us and guides us into all truth. All truth. We couldn't know this apart from the Holy Spirit revealing it to me in the same way with you it sounds like it just became like a, a real awakening oh and yes my eyes were opened and i started uh feeling a powerful anointing on this i mean because i i'm very sensitive to the anointing very and i can tell when someone starts talking about well we're in the end times, you know, we're in the last day. The anointing goes like this. It just goes down to me. I mean, I just feel it's like a wet blanket going over. It's so bad. It's so bad because it's oppressive. Mm -hmm. It's oppressive because it's not true. Because it's like what you just said, that when Jesus was talking about the end of the age, he was talking about the end of the age of the old Mosaic covenant. And like, um, I had to help some folks uh, on Facebook just this week when they were talking about uh, Jesus turning over the money changers and all that tables. And I said, yes. and somebody said, well, why did Jesus do that? And I said, because they were in there trying to prop up an old system where they were in there, which the temple, by the way, was his father's house. You know, mm -hmm. uh, he could do whatever he wanted to really. Because he was the son and his dad, the temple, I mean, the, the dwelling place of God is the house of God. He could do whatever he wanted to. He went in there and he saw them selling animal sacrifices, keeping them all sin conscious. And Jesus was bringing in an entirely different system where he was the lamb of God. And he didn't want all these other animals being sacrificed because he was the ultimate and final sacrifice of god and he didn't uh, his blood was uh, was enough and it was absolutely it sat you know it was absolutely all that it took and he was in there uh to set order in the kingdom of god that we don't go and have a blood sacrifice or anything like that uh it's not by our works and, and we certainly don't go and buy blood sacrifices at a temple now i probably told you before my mother my mother was uh her family was jewish and yeah. uh when she got fired up for jesus and on fire for god uh, and got the revelation uh that really there's not really no and she i'm gonna tell you what she says my mother used to say that there's no such thing as a Jew. <laughs> i mean she my mom was radical she'd say you know people are funny you know, that, that whole thing's over. The whole thing's over. You know, I mean, she, she could go there and like nobody else. Um, and she would say things like Jesus was a Palestinian. You know, he was born in Palestine. And they didn't like any of that stuff, you know. But she would um, ask her uh, sister and friends on Yom Kippur, where were they going? You know, where are you guys going? They would say, we're going to the temple. And my mother would say, oh, really? Well, where's your uh, blood sacrifice? You know, you got to go down there with your blood sacrifice. You don't you have, where's your animals? And they would say, what are you talking about? My mother would say, well, the Torah says you can't stand before a, a holy God without a blood sacrifice, right? You know, you know, they didn't believe the Torah. Not really. No, no none of them really do. Let's just face it. Uh, 613 laws. Yeah, uh-huh. Do you ever eat a cheeseburger? Do you ever put milk in your, you know, it's just crazy. All right. So they said, well, where's your sacrifice, Bobby? And my mother said, the lamb of God is my sacrifice. And so she had a revelation of the lamb of God. That's what Jesus was in there. Um, this whole eschatology thing, 
uh, this whole eschatology. Uh, and by the way, there are no end times and last days of the church. There are no end times and last days of the body of Christ. There are no end times and last days of the new heaven and the new earth and the new Jerusalem, which is us. We're all it. Mm -hmm, We're mm -hmm. it. And once we, uh, you know, realize that we'll be a lot better off. But the whole story begins in Matthew 21, Matthew 21, and it ends on Matthew 25, the whole story. I wrote my doctoral thesis on fulfilled eschatology, um, and, and it was uh, controversial but I proved it. I proved it. Scripture interpreting scripture. I use grammar and history. And that was how I interpret it from a historical perspective. And, um, and, you know, it's so interesting. I never thought God would assign me to be teaching this. Like I teach this. I'm known to teach this. I even have a podcast now called Present Truth Matters, and it's really about this particular topic. And you know what's so strange about all this? The very thing that scared me so badly as a child and a teenager is the very thing God has called me to teach, but teach it correctly, not incorrectly. Yeah. I hope no child ever suffers uh, the, um, the fear that I went through and I, and I hope no teenager suffers like I suffered as a teenager with this horrible, horrible teaching. And a lot of people wonder why their teenagers don't want to go to church anymore. It was scary. If you're talking about the end times of the devil and hell and all that stuff, that's not, that's not good news. It, that's not edifying. And um, I like what you said earlier about all prophets need to hear this. I know one thing, if there's one message every prophet needs to get straight is the fulfilled prophecies of Jesus. They need to know what's fulfilled because when you get out there and you start prophesying out of a flawed teaching, you know, really, that is, it's slanderous. It's because it's slandering the truth of the Lord. It's the truth of God. It's calling Jesus a liar. It's actually calling him a liar. So, oh, he really didn't. You said that all these things are going to happen in the generation of your disciples, but they didn't. You know, I mean, I have had to put it to some people that directly. Like, so you know who called Jesus a liar was C.S. Lewis. He actually said that that's one thing Jesus lied about. I'm not kidding you. You can look it up online. It is a direct quote that C.S. Lewis was messed up on this. And, and, you know, what I found out when I did all my digging and studying on all this, because in, in uh, the mid-1800s, Dr. Bill, the mid-1800s is when a lot of these things started getting taught. And they started getting taught by the Jesuits. Actually, they started getting taught by the Jesuits in the 1500s because they had to have some kind of story to counter Martin Luther and Calvin and their uh, protests against the Pope and the Roman Catholic system. And so they had to come up with something. So they had the Jesuits go around teaching this uh, fulfill, uh, futuristic dispensational eschatology, which is what a lot of evangelicals are teaching. And um, we saw that in the mid 1800s, it was the um, Oxford Press, which is owned by the Rothschilds, that printed the uh, C.I. Schofield Bible. Now that got circulated for free um, in World War I. All the, they, they gave that Schofield Bible out for free to the soldiers who thought they were in the end of the world in World War I all over. They thought this has got to be the end of the world and they read the Schofield Bible and they thought it was. They did the same thing uh, in the uh, Civil War. They did the same thing right after the Civil War. They did the same thing in World War II. They go and find people that are at a very low place with a war or some kind of a, you know, a depression or, or, or famine or whatever, or catastrophe, disaster, and they say, see that? This means we're in the end times in the last days. It's not true. It's not true. And all that's, all that's false teaching because it counters the words of Jesus Christ himself. 
And if we don't look to the words of Jesus Christ himself as our final authority when it comes to these things, then we will be like the person that goes off about an inch and then keeps on going and going and going and going. And it's a tangent. And before you know it, you're so far away from the truth, you don't know how to get back there. Well, I thank God that there's a message going out. I thank God for your ministry that you and Dr. K and all you guys are doing this uh, with us. You know, actually, we've got people, God's raising up people that are bold and that are walking love and that are patient because it takes that, it takes that, it takes patience and gentleness and boldness to get this message out. You know, that's the thing my wife and I are discovering. We have a nearly 450 students worldwide. We now have a representative in Russia and, and their students there. Uh, and we continue with uh, Austria, uh, the UK. Um, um, uh, uh, I'm going to miss something, I know. Uh, 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 Thailand, um, Sri Lanka. Um, uh, I mean, uh, Canada, the U.S., and multiple countries in Africa so that we have to have an international director over Africa so we're legally registered in one of the countries in Africa. All of that has to happen. Uh, be, and what we have found is is being patient with people who don't understand truth. Uh, and here's what I mean by that. Think about it. We have Anglican bishops in our college. We have military people from... Uh, uh, Sierra Leone, Africa, from the military, uh, the police department, from the government. We have a, a, what we would call a senator or a, a, a judicial person. We have people like that in our, our college. The, the police, the head uh, of detectives is in our college. Uh, in other countries, again, we have Anglican bishops. We have Baptists, Methodists, Presbyterian, Catholic, um, it would and and many Pentecostals. It wouldn't surprise me if we have a uh, a few Muslims. I think we do, um, and and all kinds of people worldwide who have been raised on and they've fed on this belief system of the end times. And you know, I remember when I was a little boy, uh, Doctor Cindy, in my dad's junior boys Sunday school class, and telling me Jesus is coming soon. So what am I thinking as a little boy? I'm thinking Jesus is coming soon. Wow. So cool. I look back now at 67 and I'm so thankful Jesus didn't come soon. I'm so thankful that whole thing was not the truth because I am grateful to still be here. Now, I remember when uh, I won't mention the name uh, or how I'm related to him, but someone said this. Uh, I, I said that you could live as long as you want to live. They said, why would I want to live till I get old? I just want to I just want to go. And I remember my father who, who got burnt out in ministry. Uh, I, I'm already past the age uh, of when he was burnt out and, and, and the years, I think, of ministry. But but the thing is, because my, my profession is I will never get burnt out. Amen. I will never get tired out. Uh, and I will never get run out. Because <laughs> I've, I've had all kinds of stuff said about me. But my point is this, that my dad said, I just want to die and go home. And I remember when we got the phone call, uh, here's a guy that's known. I mean, he was at the edge of present truth, but he just couldn't step over it. He would wow. dabble in it, but he just couldn't step over it. And I've known many ministers that, that, that were that way. And I remember when we got the call and my dad said, uh, my, my, my family said, your dad is in the, the hospital up near St. Louis. Uh, and uh, uh, the doctors say that cancer has now spread throughout all of his organs. And... So my wife and I walk into the room. Here's my family. They're they're joking and horsing around, and and which is typical of my family. Uh, but they all get quiet when I walk in. So my my wife and I walk in, and we say, "Dad, we've come to give you a miracle." My dad said, "I don't want one. I just want to go home." Wow. And one week, and my dad actually said, "I just want to die." And he said that for I don't know, probably a year prior. But they took him home on a Wednesday, and one week later, he he uh, returned back to invisibility. And I, I say that because so many people are burnt out on life because they are mentally. Now, let me, I'm, I'm talking to, uh, I'll just be old-fashioned about this. I'm talking to Holy Ghost, 
tongue-talking believers who are burnt out because you're still looking for the end times. You're thinking how bad the world's getting. And one of these days, uh, what is it? Jesus is going to split the eastern sky and he's going to appear up in the 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 atmospheric clouds and you're going to see him. The whole world's going to see him. Uh, even if you're on the other side of the world, uh, at whatever point in time he's going to appear in that one place, somehow you're going to see him. Then they start to say, well, it's, it's, by, it's going to be uh, televised by satellite. Then you got a bunch of people who don't have televisions. So I don't, I don't know how people really thought all this was going to work, but I want to tell you something. We went through all the videos, Dr. Cindy. In our church growing up, they would play these videos about uh, the Antichrist, which is no such, there's no such, I mean, there is and there isn't, but it's not in the book of Revelation. Uh, the beast was not the Antichrist. It was the governors of Rome, uh, the emperors right. of Rome. But, but, but you know, we, we watch all these videos, like you said, about the beheadings. And, and yeah, they're frightful. And, and the Left Behind series, you don't want to get left behind. And, and here's our loving God. The bus driver gets taken. Guess what happens to the bus? It crashes and all the people get killed and burn up. Or the pilot and the co-pilot go and the planes are crashed. I mean, it's really ridiculous. So uh, here's the thing. When it comes to biblical interpretation, which I know you you teach this, I have a course. I'm, I'm going to be doing a part two in our, either our master or doctorate cl uh, classes. But I, I've taught a biblical inter proper biblical interpretation. Now, I know there are the, the five W's and there are the rules for interpreting scripture, but I moved them all down one and I added my own. My first rule of biblical interpretation is common sense. Amen. You know how many people read scripture and say, but this just doesn't make sense. There's a reason why. Okay. <laughs> if you're looking around and you're still here, Jesus hadn't come, you're doing great. Hey, something's going on. Yeah. Pay Isn't that right? The first rule of the kingdom is pay attention. Yeah. And so many people aren't paying attention. Right. Behold, pay attention. Behold, pay attention. <laughs> that would work. That's right. Yeah, so, um, yeah, this is so good. This is so important. I mean, once you start seeing this now, our, our, um, I, I got to tell you, for years, because I, I, I came into this in 1999. I came into this year that the Y2K scare, you know, was being advertised. Yes. Okay. And I everybody remember. was getting all ready, uh, you know, for the big uh, up in the air. And um, yeah, so it was it was qu really quite interesting. My my oldest son was 12 years old and some kids, some pastor's children were telling him uh, that they did not have a vision for the future because they were going to go up in the air. And Kyle was saying, uh, wait a minute, if the earth is a sphere and America is up and Australia is down. Come on. Wouldn't you go out instead of up? I mean, even the prepositions don't work out, you know? And it's like <laughs> basic grammar, basic grammar. And um, there, there's really, to me, I mean, I have my own, uh, uh, I have my own ideas, I should say, about why this is being sold to the church. Mm -hmm. I believe, I just do, that this is not an accident. I believe that this lie of uh, dispensational futuristic eschatology, I believe that it is something that is being um, uh, propagated, it's, it's being sold, it's being uh, marketed to the church, if you will, because it keeps the church paralyzed diluted and dwarfed it keeps everybody down it keeps everybody um so you know we're to have because people say to me all the time when they get done with my con i do conferences on this i take them through all 51 uh, verses in matthew 24 and then we go over and spend a few hours over into uh matthew 25 and we go over the parables jesus is saying three parables on matthew 25 about you know in three different ways about how you know there is the the wicked servants and then the the good ones and, and that's got to do with the apostate jews uh versus the ones who are uh, following him and he's going into it with different illustrations because they all understood uh metaphors and stories and that kind of thing and parables so 
-hmm. Anyway, I've had people say to me, like at the end of a, a conference, they'll say, oh no, so if everything's in the past, what are we going to do now? What are we supposed to be doing? And I said, well, you go back to Genesis 128, to the blueprint, to the original intent, be fruitful, multiply, replenish, subdue, and have dominion. And I wrote a, I wrote a book called The Garden Mandate, um, and it's about that, the five things that we're to do. You know, that's, that's having a Christ-centered uh, worldview, because some people say, I used to teach, uh, I was asked to teach at one time at a Christian school, if I would teach biblical worldview, and I told them I would not teach biblical worldview, I would teach a Christ-centered worldview. Mm -hmm. I believe it's different, because a biblical worldview could mean that we uh, keep on uh, trying to do all those 613 laws of Moses, that's a biblical worldview, or we could, you know, we could be hanging out in the old covenant all day, and, you know, be all this other, you know, it's ridiculous, we could, let's have polygamy, you know, let's have 15 wives and stuff you know Solomon did it that's a biblical worldview you can twist all this stuff and I said no Absolutely. it's got to be Christ-centered that's the difference so I don't I don't teach biblical worldview I teach Christ-centered worldview because I believe it's powerful because as he is so are we in this world and he is ruling and reigning in this world is what he's doing we're not waiting for him to come back and and you know set everything in order it's like my son said one time when he was 12 to his friends that were pastors kids when you you say and jesus is coming back on a white horse from outer space i mean is he gonna like have a helmet on because he's got lungs he's got to have something for oxygen and you know the horse has lungs too so i'm sure the horse has to also have a helmet and and he thought this was all sci-fi you know and, and joking and he was like, and um, when he comes back, will it be wearing an Armani suit or a robe or a space outfit, you know, uh, an astronaut? And so it's like, really, this stuff is crazy. It's all metaphorical. Just so people know that's watching, a uh, white horse that stands for white always is purity and horse is strength. And so Jesus comes, come, uh, the parousia, which is the word parousia, is P A R. Uh, P A uh, R P A U R. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm P A R O U S I A. There we go. Uh, I had to close my eyes so I could see the see the words, you know, because um, I'm looking at your World Bible School. I'm trying to say that. Uh, but anyway, uh, that's not how you spell Parousia. So anyway, um, I am, uh, you know, so glad that whenever you learn. The Greek word parousia means the appearing of Christ, the appearing of Christ. And last Sunday night at our church, I'm the teaching pastor at our church, and I taught uh, on uh, shining, shining, to shine. Let your light so shine among men. Don't hide your light under a bushel, but shine. Shine means be brilliant. Mm -hmm. uh, shine means uh, you don't hide you don't hide your you don't hide out you you step up to the plate you step forward and you shine and you're you're shining uh the word shine means a prolonged it means to prolong the illuminated uh uh frequency if you will uh to prolong it to shine means that you just continue continue to be the light you don't stop being the light you co you continue it's efficacious really efficacious meaning it started and it continues and it's effective and so we we are effective in our shining and that shining is having dominion because whenever there's a dark place a dark thing going on we are to step into that with light and dispel it that's having dominion and that's not waiting on Jesus to come back and shine. He's saying, you shine. It's funny because he goes, I am the light of the world. And then he turns around and says, oh, by the way, you're the light of the world. Okay? Right. Tag. You're it. You know, he's, he's fun. Jesus likes to play around and he likes to tag us. He says he's something that he'll tag us and go, now you are. 
you know, and it's like, I, I used to tell my little boy, my grown men's sons when they were little boys, how Jesus liked to play tag. And he said he was the light of the world. And then he went, tag, you're the light of the world. And he said, you know, that, um, you know, he, all things, uh, he said, he goes, the glory, Lord, that you've given me, I now give them. Yeah. Tag, you're it. You've got the glory, you know? And so they thought that was fun, that Jesus took everything that was in him that the father gave him and just gave it to us too, you know? And he's like, everything Jesus had, he shared healing and, and miracles and, and the ability to speak and, and, and to teach. I mean, my sons, I told them very young. I told them very young about their identity. I told them, I said, did Jesus teach and preach? And they went, yes. I go, then you can. You can right. get up and you can teach and preach and whatever Jesus did, you can do. And they're like, okay. They became little teachers and preachers when they were very young. They would stand up. Oh my goodness. They stand up on top of picnic tables at a park and let it rip, you know, and everybody would come around and look and see this little kid, five years old up there with a Bible turned upside down. You know, they, they preached with the Bible turned upside down. Yeah. He was reading it. But um, yeah, it was fun. We got that on video. I'm glad we did because those are beautiful memories. But yeah, you know, when you when you teach your children at a young age to have dominion and you teach them, you know, that they are to be fruitful and 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 that their fruitfulness is is duplicatable and they're to replicate that, you know, and never be jealous of somebody's copying what you're doing. That's a big compliment because I tell them, look at that, you're multiplying. Because they'd say, you know, so-and-so's copying me. I go, that's wonderful. You're, you're, you're copy worthy. You are a copy worthy person, you know? And they would go, oh, okay. And they got a kingdom perspective on things. But um, yeah, I mean, I, I thank God for present truth. I thank God for the Holy Spirit. And if I could speak to anybody out there who's a prophet or who is prophetic, if you're a prophetic person, and you see visions and, and you hear from God and, and, and mm -hmm. you, you know, have a very intimate relationship with the Lord. I, I want to, I want to ask you if you have not opened up your heart to receive present truth and to let Jesus talk to you about what his word says about, you know, what already occurred in the past and, and then start to live in the now. I still strongly believe in prophetic ministry. But if right. it's not surrendered under proper teaching, it's going to be a mess. It's just going to be a mess, you know. And and uh, I think that God is calling us to level up. We just need to level up. And um, we do that by, uh, we level up by letting the, the Holy Spirit shine his light in our heart and let us um, put away things that, that just are frankly um, flawed. They're not correct. And I've had to tell very um, dignified, uh, distinguished ministers that I respect tremendously that they're wrong. I've had public debates with them. And, um, you know, a lot of times people in church don't like to see a woman debating a man, you of know. Course on eschatology <laughs> but but you know what i'm right now i'm in my second week uh well i just posted my second week of a course called um marriage and ministry and you know it is a common consensus around the world that uh you're called to your ministry so if i'm out all night long or if i'm running all day long and I ignore my family it's just because I'm called to the ministry but it could cost you your marriage or at least it could cost you the uh, the, the intimate uh, connection you have with your family and and especially when it comes to husbands and wives and I teach that in the light of it may be the wife who is the senior minister it may be the husband who's the senior minister the wife may stay at home the husband may have a secular job and the wife is the the senior pastor of a church it can work all all kinds of ways but uh, but we, we have a male dominant society okay now I don't think that's changed a whole lot uh, I was raised in 
men, a men rule mindedness in my home. Uh, my wife was not, so that didn't work. <laughs> uh, it only took a couple of weeks for that not to work. And, uh, but, uh, but the, the point I'm getting at is that, um, love Dr. K, she's awesome. Yeah. Uh, are you talking about my wife, Dr. Faye? Yes. Dr. Faye. I'm sorry. I love, Dr. I, know. Faye. I love Dr. K and Dr. Faye. That's a yeah. Matter. Yeah. They, uh, Yeah, and so, but anyway, uh, one of the things that triggered present truth for me, uh, it, it's it's kind of been a progressive ride. So it wasn't just the book of Revelation, but it's when I began to see uh, Genesis chapter 1 from the Hebrew. And when I found out that in Genesis chapter 1, eternal truth was established, something happened in me. I, I come. I, I woke up to the fact that if eternal truth was established in Genesis one, then eternal truth can never be undone. No matter if you look at an old covenant, a new covenant, whether you're Jew, whether you're uh, a Chaldean, whether you're Greek, whatever uh, persuasion you are of, uh, it cannot change because present truth was established. And I didn't see the end result of present truth until Revelation chapter 21 and 22. So that told me then there's a whole lot of opinion between Genesis 2 and Revelation 20. Mankind's version of, I mean, what's one of the biggest things you hear? God wrote the Ten Commandments. It's the law of God. Um, I Somewhere I read where it's the law of Moses. Yeah, oh, uh, amen. <laughs> you are so... You know, when you bring that out, every time I've heard you say that a few times, every time you say that, there is a powerful anointing on that truth. You know, and I and I, I get it that we have just read the Bible basically from the King James uh, all of our lives. And here's the problem. Uh, Britain was uh, in a war. They were divided. Half of the country followed King James. Now, I'm not going to talk about the other half because I really don't know much about it. But I do know that King James wanted a Bible for his half of the division. So he hired all these people to write the Bible. Now, the Bible of King James was never intended to be a worldwide version of Scripture. But it's become the authorized Bible for the whole world. And that really needs to be thrown out of your, your theology, folks. I'm telling you. It's uh, true. It's true. Yeah. So, um, yeah, and it's so important that we do understand present truth, that it's not about tomorrow. Uh, because if you look at what Peter said, Peter said that one day with the Lord is as a thousand years and a thousand years is one day. And again, an alarm went off in me that God lives in a now moment. So when he said, like be, he's still living in that now moment. Yeah. But it's we in our humanness who live, in, we think we live in linear time. I think what's going to happen, Dr. Cindy, is one day we'll stop living in, in linear time. Our linear time is shrinking until we start living in God's now moment. Yes. And that is present truth. Yes, it is. It's so powerful. It's so much more exciting. I, I get so excited when I hear about that because that's true. It's not false. The other's false. Mm -hmm. You know, the other is just false. It's, it's incorrect. You know, if I can ever get the other three volumes of the book of Revelation done, uh, I have two other books that will be coming out. Uh, it's the Theology of Creation 1 and 2. And I'm really excited about that. Um, but, but anyway, yeah, so uh, if people are really struggling with the concept of present truth, I know you said a whole lot. Just give us a, a closing word. Uh, how how do you how do you just? I mean, for me, nobody could have said, "Here's how you do it." I mean, I I, I guess I was just hard headed enough. Although I've always kind of pushed to know what were you saying in the first century, Lord, or in in uh, in 1245 BC when Joshua died. I mean, when you look at all of that, what is the real deal, Lord? Because my English Bibles aren't helping me any. How do I open up my heart and say, okay, Lord, fill me with present truth? So I believe what you do is you open up your Bible and you start reading and you read with um, 
some critical thinking skills. This is just what I believe. I guess because I'm a teacher and that's, uh, I like words and I like grammar and I think it's powerful. Let's say you go to Matthew 24. Here's an exercise that I always like to do with people when they're just getting started with this, okay? Go to Matthew 24 and, uh, you know, however you want to do it, take a pen or a magic marker or whatever they're called, highlighter pen, and highlight the word you, Y-O-U, and find out who is you. Like when Jesus said, and you will see this and you will see, because, you know, this is what Jesus is saying. Jesus is talking to four men on the Mount of Olives. We know that from Matthew 13, verse 3, because that is the synoptic. And so what we do is we see when Jesus says you, you find out who is you. I mean, I did this with, with okay, my sons, they had friends. Uh, they're grown now, but they, had, they used to hang out with a lot of young uh, people that used to come to our house a lot. And they were all ministers, children, or ministry leaders, children. Um, right. We were we homeschooled our kids, and so did a lot of ministers. They homeschooled their kids too. And so anyway, they come over, and I'd say, "Okay, guys, I want y'all to do something. This is your reading assignment. Go to Matthew twenty-four and look and see when Jesus said, like in verse four, he says, and Jesus answered and said to them, them." Oh, not us? Yes. Them. Take heed that no one deceives you. Yes. So if he's talking to them and he says, take heed that no one deceives you, who is you? Mm -hmm. Is that us or them? And they all go, them. And I say, okay, then you must be plural. Right? They went, yeah. I go, you is plural in here, this, this situation. They're going, uh-huh. And then he goes, for many will come in my name saying I'm the Christ and, and will deceive many and you will hear wars and rumors of wars. Who is you? Us or them? And they went, them. And so we yeah. did this game. I said, just go and every time it says you, ask yourself, who is you? Us or them? And then whenever you start to see this in basic grammar and you, cause I, I, I did a, a whole, I did a whole article that called who is you It's terrible grammar, but who is you? And when you realize who you is in Matthew 24, and he's not talking to us, he's talking to them about something that was relevant to them. It's like, That's do right. y'all really think that Jesus is on the Mount of Olives in the first century talking to four uh, disciples of his about nuclear warheads and Apache helicopters and computer chips? Do you really think he's doing that? Do you? And they're like, no, that's ridiculous. I go, amen. I'm so glad you think that's ridiculous because it is ridiculous because it's just, it, it goes to show that, that uh, we have a lot of work to do to help people unlearn how this has been taught for so long. That's right. But I believe the Holy Spirit will open up everyone's heart just the way he did our hearts. I do. I, I do believe that he is that interested. The Holy Spirit is that interested in us knowing the truth because he leads us and guides us into all truth. Yes. Amen. I agree. And, and, you know, um, uh, one of my favorite prophetic words in scripture is from Habakkuk, Habakkuk, uh, Habakkuk uh, that uh, tells us that uh, the glory of the Lord will cover the earth like the waters cover the sea. Uh, we are the earth singular and the sea is the sea of humanity, plural. And I believe that because God said that, that's exactly the way it will be. So what I believe is there's awakening, an awakening taking place right now. And there are people who are experiencing this awakening. And in some cases, they don't realize what they're experiencing. 
uh, and and so it's strange to them. And I think that's been the case with me. I've seen things, I've experienced things, and at the time they were strange, but in time they became very real, very uh, comfortable to me. And I think there are people out there that are are experiencing th some things, but they don't understand them. Don't shove them away. Uh, don't push them aside. Just just continue to ride the wave, as it were. And I'm I'm not a surfer, but but continue to ride the wave, as it were, and just just uh, go along with what the Lord is trying to reveal to you, because it's going to make sense. Um, Dr. Sandy, thank you so much. This has really been good. Thank you for having me. I always love to talk about this topic. It's wonderful, and I just thank God for everyone who's uh, with us tonight and who will watch later. And um, yes. They can always reach out to either one of us if they have more questions. Absolutely. And, you know, I have taught uh, the entire uh, chapter of Matthew 24, and uh, I would I need to go back and teach it again. But one of these days, maybe we could do a you know tag team on Matthew 24. That would be awesome just to get yes. different perspectives. Um, because you brought in a lot of history that I wasn't necessarily familiar with, and which is fine, uh, you know, talking to a guy that, uh, 20 years ago, I, I lost my memory, um, and um, and so you know it was it was quite a, a time. But I came out of that time. This was back when I was bed fast for three years and had back surgery. I came out of that time remembering only one verse of scripture. Now keep in mind, I already have one doctorate. Okay, I have four now, but I only had one doctorate, and uh, I I I lost my memory, and I came out of remembering one verse. Proverbs 10, 7, the memory of the just is blessed. Woohoo, that'll work. And I took the principle of that. I know what it's talking about. It wasn't talking about my memory, but I took it, the principle of it and applied it. And I want to tell you something, it works. It does, because you took the rhema word, mm -hmm. the, the, the rhema word of it. I love that application. I, I love it. And it worked for me. So, Amen. yeah. And you and, added uh, faith to it. You add yeah. to it. Yeah. So, very cool. Well, uh, stay right there if you have time uh, to chat just for a minute. Um, and uh, we want to thank everybody for watching. This was my last broadcast for the week because there will be no show tomorrow. Thank you, everybody, for watching. Uh, I, I want to remind you, I'll, I'll be posting this, but I want to remind you to click like and then click share so that other people will uh, watch this uh, video. Um, and, um, you know, they can go back, they can go to our YouTube channel and they can go to, um, uh, uh, world Bible school media and you'll see the WBSU, all that information there. Uh, but you can, uh, look at, uh, back on, uh, January 17th, I believe it is. And you can see the first session. Um, and, um, uh, it's great. So. Uh, you can get both uh, both sessions and, uh, and and get some education in the meantime. And I love I love education. I don't like just to talk. I believe that whether you're an apostle or not, and we are both very apostolic. I believe that every apostle should teach, even though every teacher is not called to be an apostle. So that's just that's just my thing. So anyway, we love you all, and uh, we'll see you next Tuesday on the panel discussion and the shows we have for you next week. Have a great evening. We'll see you soon. Bye-bye, everyone.